Hi everyone, in this video I'll be doing Advent of Code 2021, Day 23. I'll be doing the puzzles, then explaining them afterwards, so let's get started. Alright, let's explain the puzzles. For Day 23, we encounter a group of amphipods, and they are living in a burrow consisting of a hallway and four side rooms. We are asked to organize them into the side rooms according to their type, so we have amphipods of type A through D, and we need to organize them so that in the rooms they go A, A, B, B, C, C, and D, D. Every amphipod, when they move, <clears throat> uses some amount of energy, and we have to minimize the total amount of energy they use. There are also some rules we have to follow, which make the puzzle a little bit more difficult, but, you know, we ought to follow the rules. So, the answer uh, is the total amount of energy they use, the minimum total amount of energy again. So. Um, yeah, for part two, it's pretty similar, except we just insert these two predefined rows into the map so that the side rooms now consist of four spaces instead of just two. So part one and part two are actually pretty similar. So I'm just going to explain sort of an overview for both parts and then dive into the details because I think today's puzzles were quite implementation heavy. There's a lot of edge cases, lots of uh, implementation stuff that we have to be careful of. So here's how I did it for part one. We have eight total amphipods, and we're going to represent each amphipod as a tuple. This tuple contains three numbers, its location, its room, and its depth. Exactly one of location and room or depth is going to be not negative one. So if an amphipod is inside a room, we're going to have its location be negative one. If it's in the hallway, then its room and depth are going to be negative one. So location just represents its location in the hallway. Room represents which room it is in. I'm indexing the rooms as two, four, six, and eight, just because the, the X coordinates kind of line up better that way. And then the depth is their depth within the room. So either one or two. Hopefully that should be pretty intuitive. Um, and hopefully you can remember that um, as I go through my solution. Anyway, so we're just representing the entire state of the whole situation as a list of eight tuples, each tuple representing a single amphipod. Once we have that, we're going to write a function to determine all possible next states given a current state. Um, and this is helpful because we're going to try to search the entire tree. Um, and actually, it's not really a tree. So say this is the starting state. Uh, we look at everything that could happen next, all possible moves, and they're going to lead to some other states. And then we're going to keep going down in this manner um, until we hit a state that is the ending state. So end right there. And there might be some like stuff in between as, as well. Uh, and we're going to try to search this entire tree, but the thing is that we can't just search the entire tree because there's also going to be cycles in here. So we could have, say, start here um, and some more states here and more states here, but maybe we could also go from start directly to this state. Uh, actually, this isn't possible. Maybe something like, maybe something more indirect like that. So perhaps uh, we could go directly from the start to another state that would, could it also be reached? through two other um, intermediate states. And for this reason, we have a graph instead of a tree, which means we're going to have to use a graph searching algorithm such as Dijkstra's. And I explained Dijkstra's in an earlier Advent of Code video. I think it was the one where we had to go through a map, a two-dimensional map. So I'll probably link to that up above and you can check out my explanation of Dijkstra's algorithm. There'll also be a link in the description to give you an overview of the algorithm. So yeah, given a state, we're going to be able to compute all next states. We're going to search all possible states and find the lowest cost of the ending state. Now, let's jump into the details for this first step, the function to determine all possible states. I called this children, so children of a state. Really, it should be like neighbors or something because it's not really a tree. But anyway, the idea is that we're going to loop through all the amphipods. To get all possible next states, we're going to loop through all the amphipods and see where they might go. And there are two possibilities for this. One, they might enter their destination room directly, um, or they might try to enter the hallway if they're inside a room. Note that amphipods can enter their destination room if, they're star if they start out from a room. They just can't enter the hallway from another point in the hallway according to this rule right here. They never move from the hallway. Oh, sorry. They will stay in the hallway until they can move into a room. So once we're in the hallway, we cannot move to the hallway again. We can only move into a room. So we're going to loop through all the amphipods, see where they can go. But first of all, to make our solution more efficient, we want to make sure that our amphipod is not satisfied yet. So if it's already in its target room and all of its like 
partners, I guess you could say, of the same type are already in there already, then it's sort of settled in and it doesn't need to move any further. So uh, we just need to make sure that uh, this Amplified is currently not satisfied and it needs to move. So case one, it's not really in the hallway. It could be either in the hallway or in a room. So what we do here is we compute first its destination room. And its destination room is simply going to be which room um, it is supposed to be in at the end. So for example, for an Amplipod B, its destination room would be four because I'm indexing this again as two, four, six, eight. So destination room, uh, we compute that pretty simply using the type, which is represented um, by an integer from one, zero to four, not including four. And then after that, we try to move our Amplipod into the destination room. But first we have to make sure that if our Amplipod is inside a room, that it must be able to get out. So if we have a room, for example, that looks like this, um, we have an A here and we have a B here, this Amplipod over here cannot get out. It cannot go into another room uh, because this A is blocking it. So we need to make sure that this is not the case. And we can simply do this by looping through all of the other Amplipod Amplipods and checking if um, our, our current Amplipod has a depth of two. Uh, we need to make sure that there are no other Amplipods in the same room with a depth of one. Once we know that this Amplipod can actually get out if it's already in a room, um, if it's in a hallway, then this conditional will not be activated. We need to check if its destination room is actually available. So let's suppose we have our destination room. This Amplipod B wants to get into this destination room. Uh, it wants to go here. So let's assume that this A is not here, so it is available to move. We need to make sure that there are no other Amplipods in here if it is not of the same type. And this is because rule, uh, rule number two specifies this. It cannot move into a room unless that room is their destination room and contains no amplipods, which do not also have that room as their own destination. So uh, if it has a C in there, in its destination room, then this B cannot move in there. But if there's a B in here, then we're all good to go. So how we check for that is we need to check if there are any amplipods of a different type inside that destination room. And we do that right here. Um, and then otherwise, we're good to go. There are no amplipods of a different type inside the destination room. By the way, I should note that this code is available in the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. So don't feel like you have to understand this all right now, but I'm doing my best to explain what's happening in detail. Next, once we know that our destination room is clear and we can actually move into it, we need to figure out what's the cost for moving into it, right? Um, so how do we compute that? Well, first of all, we have to make sure there's nobody in the hallway blocking us. So for example, if there's an Amplipod A right here, then we cannot pass through this Amplipod. That is not allowed. So I also wrote this function over here to determine if an Amplipod can move into a destination X location given its current, uh, I guess, tuple representing its state. And we can simply do that by looping through all other Amplipods and seeing if there's an X position, uh, sorry, if their X position is between the starting Amplipod states uh, X location and their desired X location. So that's this conditional right here um, inside the any blocking function. So once we confirm that our Amplipod can indeed move into the ending position, we need to compute how many steps it needs to take. So we have first this coefficient representing its energy usage per step, and that's going to be 1, 10, 100, and 1,000 for amplipods of type A, B, C, and D. And we can simply do that by taking 10 to the power of their type. After that, we need to find the number of steps they actually need to take. And we can do that simply by finding the difference between its current exposition and its desired exposition, uh, taking the absolute value of the difference to make sure it's positive. Then we need to add one if it's going to move into uh, the first location. So for example, if this B is going to move right here, uh, then it would be adding one because it needs to go inside the room. Uh, and over here, if there are no other amplipods, amplipods in the target room, then we can directly move into that second state, uh, that second depth, and instead add two. After that, I'm just modifying the state of the amplipods by turning it into a list and then modifying the current amplipod at its current index. And then the new state is going to be the new cost, which is simply the old cost plus the cost for this new amplipod to move. And then it's also going to contain the actual state of the rest of the amplipod, actually all of the amplipods. So lots of conditionals, lots of uh, edge cases here to check. Now, if we are not going to move into a room, we're going to try to enter the hallway from a room. 
So first we have to make sure it's actually in a room. So its room is not negative one. That means it's in some kind of room. Uh, if it is in the hallway already, then we simply break. So we're going to try to move out of this room into the hallway. Uh, we're going to do the same check as before if it's in a room and, and it wants to move out. If it's in a depth of two, then we need to make sure there's no amphipods blocking it out of the way. Um, so there's nobody in there. And then after that is done, we check all the spots in the hallway it can move into. And remember that amphipods cannot move directly in front of a room. So we need to eliminate two, four, six, and eight from the range. After that, computing the cost to move out, which is simply the depth of the room, uh, of the amphipod's position in the room, and then adding its uh, the change in X position is going to be the cost. Then we need to make sure there's actually no amphipods blocking its way into the desired location in the hallway, just as before, using the same function. And then if this is possible, then we move our amphipod to that desired X position inside the hallway and modify the cost as well as the location of all the amphipods. Um, and that's going to be a new state as well. So there are currently three possible ways to make a new state. Again, we can move into a room or we can exit a room into the hallway. Now, you may have noticed that there's actually some redundancy here. We don't need to check if an amphipod can move from a room into another room because we can simply wait for it to move into the hallway and then into the room. Uh, but I decided to make it move into the room directly because I think that's a bit more efficient, perhaps. Maybe a bit more code, and a bit more complexity, but it's the same idea, and it's only one step instead of two, so it'll make our Dijkstra's a little bit easier. Now, we have this part one done. We have a function to determine all next states given a current state of the amphipods. So now we just have to search this giant graph using Dijkstra's. Again, I explained Dijkstra's in one of my previous Advent of Code videos. It'll be linked below, as well as a external resource to Dijkstra's. Now, how we're going to do this is we're going to maintain a priority queue of all the states that we have yet to search. We're also going to maintain a set of all our visited states, and we're going to have a cost um, dictionary showing the cost, the minimum cost to get to any given state. We're going to do the standard Dijkstra stuff. We're going to loop through the priority queue again, taking all the lowest cost states, exploring all the neighbors, adding them to the priority queue, and so on, until we reach the destination. And to do that, I'm using a function to detect whether a state is the end, and it simply goes through all the amphipods and check checks if its room is indeed its destination room. Once we have that, we have our answer, and we could just print out the cost there, but I decided to be a bit extra, um, but also for debugging purposes, I decided to print out a breadcrumb trail, I guess, of all the states leading up to the final state, which gives us a uh, sort of tour of how the amphipods can actually sort themselves into the states, printing along the way, the costs as well, to get to any state. So yeah, that's pretty much it for part one. Again, we are checking all the next possible states inside of this function, and then we're going to search that space with Dijkstra's. We could also use something else. We could probably use A star or something to make it faster, given a heuristic which is how many amphipods are within their destination rooms. But you know, Dijkstra is fast enough, it runs within a minute or so, so I'm not going to change it. Now, for part two, the only difference is our rooms have been expanded to a size of four, uh, and we have to insert these two pre-existing new rows. And how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, parsing input, um, I had a bit of trouble with this because I misread the problem, and you do actually need to put these two in the middle of the first two rows, so uh, be careful of that, don't don't insert them at the end, that's going to be a, a bit of trouble. And we do the same thing as part one basically, but I had to modify my code just a little bit. Instead of having eight amphipods, we have 16 now, and to get the type of any amphipod given its current index, we just divide by four um, and round down. Everything is basically the same, but there are a few key differences. First of all, this code that checks if um, an amphipod is inside a room and it needs to get out, uh, whether there are any amphipods in the way. This needs to be modified so that depth equals uh, 2, which becomes depth is greater than 1. So if it's inside the room at all, then it does need to check if there are any amphipods blocking the way. And that's a pretty simple modification here. We also need to amp... Uh, man, I've been saying amphipod too much. Uh, we also need to modify the code 
that uh, detects what place in the room the amphipod can occupy. Um, and before we had this in this uh, this thing right here, checking whether our partner is in the room or whether there's any amphipods of a different type inside that room. Instead, we can kind of concise that code a little bit down. And instead, we're going to replace that with a method or function that returns the amphipods in any given room. And just as an example here, um, by the way, this is the get room. This is the get room function. Uh, let's say we have a room like this. A, B, C, D, then uh, its representation from this get room function is going to be three, two, one, zero. So going from the bottom up, we are printing out all the types of the amphipods within that room. And this helps because if we're going to try to get into this room, say room number eight, and there's am amplified D inside the hallway trying to get in, then we can simply check its get room uh, representation and see if all of the amphipods in that inside that room already are of the same type. And if there's any of a different type, then we simply cannot move into that room given rule three, I believe. Yes, no, rule two. So that uh, tells us pretty easily what target depth we need to move into as well. And that's going to be this code right here that checks, checks uh, this target depth using this get room function. Condition of a given state, we can simply go through all the rooms, get all the different rooms, and make sure that the amphipods are four of them, four of the desired type inside that room. So A, for example, uh, these room number two is going to have four A's. We just need to make sure this is basically what happens for all rooms. To summarize, we're going to have three kind of modifications for part two. They're pretty minor. Uh, we can make the can exit room check a bit more specific to account for the depth of four. We can also make a new function, which is the get room function, and this helps us with two and three. Number two is making the going into room check a bit easier and as well as getting the target depth when moving from a hallway into a room or from a room into a room. And then number three, we can make our end check a bit easier just by checking all the different rooms utilizing our get room function. And after that, we use Dijkstra's just as before. So part two really is the same as part one, just with a few modifications part here, uh, right here, accounting for the depth of four, maximum depth of four. So yeah, that's part one and part two of day 23 explained. Again, the code is linked in the description. So make sure to check that out because there's a lot of details here that I kind of glossed over. But I did provide the basic overview, which is right here. Um, this is really the core bit of our algorithm for parts one and two. Uh, I do want to note that an important part of today's debugging for me was inserting all of these assert statements. So what these do in Python, they also exist in other languages, is make sure that this condition is true. It's what we expect it to be. And if it's not true, then it throws an error and stops the program. So many times while I was debugging this, these assert statements came in handy because it wasn't doing something I was expecting it to do. For example, for part two, one thing that had an assert statement was this uh, get room function. We need to make sure that get room never returns anything like this. Uh, it doesn't have any empty spots before uh, an amphipod is inside. So this would be totally not allowed because it would represent something like this, blank, blank, A, blank. And this is never allowed because these amphipods down here, how did they get out? There's no way for them to get out. So that's one place where I use an assert, an assert statement. And I inserted them uh, pretty much everywhere they were not necessary in a lot of places we can see. I used them a total of 14 times, so that's quite a bit. But they were helpful for debugging, so that's one thing I learned to use in today's puzzles. So that's it for Advent of Code 2021, Day 23. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below, and I will try to answer them. I hope you found today's puzzles fun, I know I certainly did, and I hope you found this video helpful. I'll see you tomorrow for Day 24, and thank you for watching.